Please turn to Micah chapter 4. Micah chapter 4, please. Rather, all of you could be with us to join us as we continue our study uh, this evening in the book of Micah. We pointed out each night that the book of Micah is written by uh, Micah during the period of divided kingdom when the northern kingdom had separated from the southern kingdom. Micah was primarily teaching the people of Judah, the southern kingdom, though some of what he says is for the northern kingdoms of Israel as well. And the theme that we have emphasized is the fact that he's trying to put the, God is putting the people on trial for their sins, as though he's testifying against them. And so in the first couple of chapters, he testifies about their sins and the punishment that would come. In the section that we're in now, he's testifying against the rulers, the leaders of the land. And in the last couple of chapters, he'll compare how he treated them to the way they treated him. So as we look at chapter 4 in particular, uh, we're ready for verse 4 this evening. But in the first three verses, uh, we read that the Lord would establish his house in the last days or the latter days. So what are some things we learned about that in those three verses? We talked about it a good bit. Tell me something that you learned or something the verses say about the Lord's house and it's being established in the last day. Tell me something you see about that in those verses. Frank. Uh, that the gospel will be preached in, in his name uh, to all nations to the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay, so the word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem, uh, the law of the Lord, it says, and so we understood based on other scriptures that that was fulfilled when the gospel was preached beginning in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So that was the word of the Lord going forth. What else do you see in those verses? Terry. Terry. That the house of the Lord would be established, and in this case, it's speaking of the church. All right, so the Lord's house would be established, and we pointed out from New Testament scripture that the church is referred to as the house of the Lord, 1 Timothy 3.15 and so on. So the Lord's house would be established, and the word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem. What else did we learn in those first three verses when that would happen? Okay. Uh, this uh, took place in Acts chapter 2. Um, on uh, the day of Pentecost, um, the, in the latter days, uh, Peter said this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, but it's talking about the latter days. Okay, so the latter days, he says when this would happen, but Peter identified, based on the prophecy in Joel too, that those latter days were actually in existence in Acts chapter 2. And so from that on, Hebrews chapter 1 talks about we're still in the latter days, the gospel age is the latter days, so the Lord would establish his house in Jerusalem uh, in the latter days, and uh, his word would go forth from Jerusalem, and it says that people of many nations would uh, come into the house of the Lord, which we pointed out as the Jews and Gentiles. So we have the fulfillment of the prophecy here of a beginning, the beginning of the Lord's church, which began on the day of Pentecost. People first entered it in Acts chapter 2. So here's a prophecy of the, that, the beginning, and then chapter 3 talked about how that they would beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and so on, referring to peace, spiritual peace, not necessarily physical peace with other people, but spiritual peace with among those who would serve God faithfully and be obedient to him, uh, that the, uh, first of all, peace with God would teach us to have peace with one another, but it doesn't mean peace of physical peace as we think of no, no war between nations, that's not what it's discussing, but rather the spiritual peace that would come between God and his people and between those who are his children with one another. Okay, and that's where we were at the end of our class last time through verse 3. Questions or comments, discussion anybody had on those first uh, three verses? All right, let's go ahead and read some more then. Uh, let's read verses 4 through 8. We like to read chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. First Bill, please. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. 
For all people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In this day, says the Lord, I will assembly, assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast, and those whom I have afflicted, I will make the lame a remnant. And the outcast a strong nation, so the Lord will reign over them on Mount Zion, from now on ever, forever. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Okay. So he continues describing the circumstances in the, the latter days, talking about the New Testament age, things that would happen. And in verse 4, uh, he describes them sitting under, each one under his vine and under his fig tree. Okay, so I ask you to consider that and the significance of that. Uh, let's see where we are in our questions. Question number eight. What is the significance of that and uh, what other scriptures might help us to understand what that means? Each one sitting under his vine and fig tree. Karen. Uh, it means uh, peace and contentment without war. Okay, so I ask you to look at 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 24 and 25. And so we have several passages that help us in this section of Micah. This one is not a prophecy in 1 Kings chapter 4, but it is a, uh, another passage that uses the expression that helps us to understand it. This case is talking about the peace that existed during the reign of Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 24 and 25. 1 Kings 4 verse 24 and 25. Okay, who'd like to read that for us, please? First Kings 4, verse 24 and 25. Frank, please. For he had dominion over all the region west of the Euphrates from Tip, Tipsa, Tipsa to Gaza over all the, the kings west of the Euphrates and he had peace on all sides around him. And Judah and Israel lived in safety from Dan even to Beersheba, uh, every man under his vine and under his fig tree all the days of Solomon. All right, so there you see the meaning of the expression, every man under his own vine and fig tree, is simply an expression for peace. Uh, in the case of Solomon, there was peace with regard to the nations around them, but in uh, Micah's prophecy, we saw from verse 3 that it's spiritual peace. So it's not saying that the people of God literally is going to have a vine or a fig tree, but that uh, we can dwell securely without worrying or being concerned at trouble that there are some enemy that would destroy us. Now, of course, we have spiritual enemies. That's Satan, which we will always have war with Satan. But because of the power and strength that God gives us, we can be confident that uh, we don't need to be led astray uh, because God is protecting and caring for us. Okay. Other comments on verse 4 and the vine and the fig tree and that illustration, anybody? Okay. Then in verse 5, how does he describe how people should walk? Verse 9, question number 9. How does he say that the people in this age should walk? Bill. In the name of God. Walk in the name of God, not in the name of the other gods, but walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Okay, so again, uh, this is those who are God's servants. We know that in every age there are people who followed other gods, but the people in the church that be prophesied here, they would walk in the name of their God, the true God, the Lord our God forever and ever. So I ask you to exa examine some passages about that idea of walking. Question number 10. What is the significance of it? of it? And do you have a passage maybe to help us? But it talks about walking in the name of our God. Questions or comments or discussion passages on the idea of walking in the name of our God. Terry. I have Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
Okay, so it's, when we're converted, baptized, become children of God, baptized in the death of Christ, verse 3, then we walk uh, in newness of life. So it's describing our life, our conduct. And so we have this peace with God, walking in the name of the Lord by His authority, following His instructions. Then we uh, have the peace that He describes here in verses 4 and 5. Other questions or discussion on walking in the name of the Lord or other scriptures anybody wants us to talk about? Steve. In Acts 9 and 31, in the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. All right, so there you have the, the churches. Remember now, the prophecy is a prophecy of the church. The church walking in the fear of the Lord. That's the kind of thing being described here. Bill? Zechariah 10, verse 12. <coughs> Go ahead. <coughs> so I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in His name, says the Lord. All right, now this expression then of walking is often used. We've seen it in other places in our studies. The idea of a way of life. Your walk, your walk is your conduct, the way you live. Some people walk after the flesh, their human desires, uh, or other th- uh, things that lead them astray. Uh, or you can think of Jesus in, the, in Matthew chapter 7, the two ways, the narrow way that leads to life, the broad way that leads to destruction, ways of walking. But the walking that we should do is in the name of our Lord, following Him and be obedient. And then we have the peace that's being described. Okay, other comments to verse 5. Rick. Also, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, he tells us how not to walk. It says, not walking in craftiness, lies, or deceits. Okay, so again, there's two ways to walk. You can walk in sin, craftiness, deceit, and so on, as described in that verse, or you can walk in the, in the name of the Lord. Those who are God's true people will walk in the Lord's name, not in these other ways. Okay, so then in verse 6, as we continue... What else does God say he would do in verse 6? Uh, question number 11. What does he say he would do? And notice it's still in that day. Still continuing to talk about this period uh, of the gospel in the church. Here's something else that's going to happen. Verse 6, and what's that? Rick. It's going to call out his remnant out of the lame and the outcast and those with afflictions and the poorest of the poor. All right, interesting point. He says he'll assemble the lame and the outcast who he has afflicted, and he will make them a remnant. And we'll talk about the remnant more in just a moment. But what is the significance? What did you conclude was the significance of God assembling the lame and the outcast? Now remember, still in that day, so it's spiritual. Don't don't try to take it physical because it's spiritual. But the lame and the outcast uh, that he will assemble, what is it referring to there? Okay, they're going to become the remnant. Okay, he's going to gather gather what had been driven away and make them into a remnant, he says. Okay, other comments on who this were, who these were? Frank. Well, uh, Paul talks about uh, God choosing those that are foolish in the eyes of the world to to become his kingdom. And... uh, than in the eyes of the Lord, those in in the world would become foolish. Okay, that's First Corinthians chapter one. Okay, so uh, these that uh, are not necessarily uh, those who are chosen to become part of the church and so on are not necessarily those that the world would look up to as being especially uh, honorable in the world's eyes, the wealthy or the powerful, the influential, and so on. But they're more likely to be the lame and the outcast. But God says, they're those whom I have afflicted. So what are your thoughts about, who's talking about there when he says, I have afflicted these people, Terry? He sent his people into captivity, and especially the, uh, Judah, to protect the remnant or those who would be faithful to him. There were faithful who got caught up in all of this. 
and he protected them, though they were afflicted by being in captivity. Okay, I think that's the idea. That's what it's, uh, occurred to me, too. He sent them into captivity. He's not saying that it's all going to be uh, a, a rose garden in serving God. Before that time, when he's talking about, they're going to go into captivity. He's going to fix them, but he's going to bring them out of that affliction. He said, so I will assemble the lame and the outcast whom I have afflicted. They had been afflicted, but now they have been brought out of that and made into a remnant. Okay, and a strong nation and so on, verse 7. So the remnant, the strong nation is, the, again, the, the church, the New Testament, the gospel. But before that, they had to go into captivity, which he'd been talking about throughout the book of Micah. And we saw it in Hosea and Amos and so on. They were going to be going to captivity. The northern tribes in the Assyrians, the southern tribes into the, taken by the Babylonians. They're going to go into captivity. But it's going to come a time when God's going to bless those people. In, in ways that they had never had blessings before because of the gospel in the church. Okay? And in verse 7 he calls that the remnant, which answers question number 12. Uh, so we'll talk more about the remnant in just a minute. Anything else on verse 6 before we talk more about the remnant? All right. I want to spend some time on the concept of the remnant. First of all, what is a remnant? What does the word mean? We've talked about it before times. What does the word mean? Those that are left over. Okay, so it's a, a, a part of a of a larger group. You have something large, a remnant of a rug, is the part that's left over after they cut off the parts that they used to uh, carpet somebody's home. They've got some left over from the role they started with. That's the remnant. Okay, so the remnant is a part that's left over. So you have uh, spiritually a remnant. The world in general are those who are not doing the will of God. But there's a remnant, always a, a relatively small part that's serving God. And so there are always those on that narrow road way that leads to life. In every age, God's faithful ones have only been a part of the group. And so let's look at this word remnant. So I ask you then to uh, explain it. And what well, Micah has uh, refers to it in other places, question number 13. There are other passages in the New Testament that refer to it, question number 14. So what passages do you have that talk about the remnant and that we discuss the significance of it? Somebody have a passage for Steve? Back in uh, Micah 2.12, that will surely assemble all of you of Jacob and will surely gather the remnant of Israel and will put them together like sheep of the people, like a flock in the midst of their pasture. They shall make a loud noise because of so many people. All right, so you have the, uh, the remnant in Micah chapter 2 and verse 12. Other places, other passages that refer to the, to the uh, remnant idea. All right, I gave you some of the New Testament. Let's look at these in the New Testament. Look in Romans, let's start with chapter 9 first of all. Romans chapter 9 and verse 27. Paul is explaining the concept of the remnant as it's explained now in the New Testament. Remember the Micah is predicting the church, the gospel, the New Testament. Paul is explaining it further uh, in Romans 9.27, but he's quoting from Isaiah. So who'd like to read Romans 9.27 for us, please? Steve. Romans 9.27. Isaiah also cries, cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of <coughs> children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. Okay, so the children of Israel like the sand of the sea, meaning what? The sand of the sea means a lot of them. A lot of grains of sand in the sea, but only part of it will be saved. Okay, chapter 11 then, and verse 5. Chapter 11 and verse 5. Again, if you'd like to read chapter 11 and verse 5 for us, please. Romans 11 and verse 5. Frank, please. <clears throat> So, so too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So again, a remnant. Those that are the elect by grace are a remnant. Not everybody, but those who have been chosen on the basis of their meeting the conditions to receive forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ. So God's people are a remnant. 
And if you go back now to Micah chapter 4, and there's lots of other passages, there's a, just a number of passages. If you study that concept of a remnant, God's people are part of the, uh, those in the world, but they are the ones who, as he said, he's going to assemble and bring together uh, and make a, 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 a remnant. Okay, other comments on the idea of the remnant? All right, then he says, I will make the outcast a strong nation. So I ask you on question number 15 to look at passages on that. See, all these things, it's an interesting section to me at least because all these things we're talking about, we can find New Testament passages that explain them for us. So in what sense is it, or we have a passage that shows the New Testament church being a, a nation, God's people being a nation, Terry? Okay, now well, that was First Peter chapter two. Uh, thank Nine. you, Terry. In verse five. Nine. 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 Okay, First Peter two, and verse nine. Yes. Now in verse five, we talked about last time. Uh, we're a spiritual house. That illustration. But now verse nine, we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. So you have the, all those concepts coming together here in the New Testament. The, the church, the house of God built upon the foundation of Christ, and verse 6, is also called a holy nation. Not a physical nation. Israel was a physical nation under the Old Testament. But we're talking spiritual now. A spiritual nation. That is God's nation, God's people. The chosen nation under the Old Testament was a physical nation. The chosen nation under the New Testament is a people we choose whether or not we'll be part of it. If we make the choice to be one of his people, by obedience to the gospel, then he chooses us to be part of his, his people, his nation over which he, he rules, also referred to as a kingdom, which Christ is the king, which we talked about last time as well. Other passages on the idea of the uh, God's people under the New Testament as a nation. Frank. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord is spirit, and the Jeremiah 31 and 33, and uh, he writes, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Okay, so again, the idea of being God's people, but it's prophesied in Jeremiah 31, fulfilled in the New Testament, as explained by the writer of Hebrews here in Hebrews chapter 8. Uh, so again, God to bringing his people, bringing them together to make his special people under the New Testament, but not a physical nation, but a spiritual body of the church. Okay? All right, so these promises being fulfilled, as we come back to Micah chapter 4 then, this nation, the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion. Again, spiritual. Remember that when the Lord would go forth from Zion, God will reign over them uh, forever, he says, uh, in Mount Zion. Other comments through verse 7. Bill. Now this be in the Old Testament, but in Isaiah 24, verse 23, it says, Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion in Jerusalem and before his elders, of course. Okay. And this is where we get the idea then of the New Testament church as the spiritual kingdom. Because it's going to fulfill the prophecies of the, the nation. Jesus would come to rule as king. So the kingdom is the church. They're not separate things the way some people think. Uh, God didn't think he would establish the kingdom when Jesus came, but it didn't work out because the Jews killed him, so they gave the church instead. They give the kingdom when he comes back. No, that's completely contrary to what God intended. The church is the kingdom, the nation, over which the Lord reigns. Okay, he reigns as king over his kingdom now, but it's the church. It is this spiritual body, uh, the house of God, which he established uh, in Jerusalem 
beginning in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. So we read last time from Colossians 1, 13 and 14 that all now who have been delivered from uh, transgression have been delivered into, transferred rather, into this kingdom, the kingdom of the Son. Okay, anything else through verse 7? Anybody? All right, now then, he uses some other illustrations to describe it, beginning in verse 8. Uh, what illustration does he use beginning in verse 8 uh, to describe this? Well, he uses a different illustration in verse 8, and what illustration is that? Verse 8. Um, a stronghold. A stronghold and a, okay, a stronghold and a tower, a tower of the flock. So now, now you have a flock, a different illustration for the, the house, the people. They're not just a nation and a house, they're a flock. And uh, there's a, a stronghold uh, of the former dominion shall come the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem so now you have this kingdom coming uh, and a stronghold which is referred to as a, a flock comments or discussion on, on that what, the, what does he mean by that um, in verse 8 right well uh, oftentimes in that part of the world in those times they would bring the sheep in at night to a sheepfold, and where they were corralled in and, and protected, and there would be a tower for a watchman uh, <clears throat> to watch over the sheep and watch out for danger. And so, comparing that to making the application, the church or the kingdom, and uh, we are in. Christ, who is watching out for us in his sheepfold. Okay, that's what I got out of it, too. Uh, this one is maybe a little bit more difficult than some of the other, but uh, the idea of a flock would have a, a tower or a stronghold where the sheep, the shepherds would guard the sheep. And if, we, if that's the meaning of the illustration, then the church is God's flock. And who is the, the good shepherd who guards the flock? The shepherd would be Jesus. Jesus, yes. I am the good shepherd, John chapter 10. And so he watches for the sheep, said he would even give his life for the sheep. So he's guarding for the sheep. And uh, back to verse 7, he would reign over the, them and uh, he would have dominion over them uh, when we come to this stronghold, the tower of the flock. Verse 8. Okay, other comments to verse 8 anyway. All right, let's read some more then and get some more of the uh, application. Well, for now, let's just read verse 9 and 10. We'd like to read verse 9 and 10 for us, please. Verse 9 and 10, uh, Steve, please. Now, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. But be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in birth pangs. For now you shall go forth from the city. You shall dwell in the field, and to Babylon you, sh you shall go. There you shall be delivered. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. All right, now remember how we've talked about several times in our study of the Minor Prophets, but the prophet will talk about punishment that's coming upon the nation for their sins. Then he'll talk about the coming of Jesus and the gospel of the New Testament and the, the blessings they would have in the future. They come back and talk about their problems, their evils and the consequences they're going to suffer now. Then he goes back and talks for a while about the coming of the kingdom, the fulfillment with the Messiah and so on. It seems to me that's what's happening here. So he's been in the verse back in chapter 3, he's talking about their sins the rulers and the leaders and that they're going to go into captivity for it. Now chapter 4, the first part, now through at least through verse 8, okay, in the latter days, sometime in the future, 
there's going to be blessings. Okay, but not, not now. It's in the future. That the house of the Lord will be established and you have the Lord reigning over them and all these blessings. But now, in verse 9 and 10, first again, there's still going to be a problem. He says they're crying aloud. Uh, and so he, he, he discusses the problems they're having now and the questions that, uh, the problem that they face. He says, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. So what, what does it mean? What are your thoughts on the meaning of, why does he say, is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? What is the significance of when he says these things? Terry. The thought came to me that they had rejected their king who was gone. So there wasn't a king in their midst. Nobody leading them in the ways of righteousness. And so, um, yes, their counselors had perished. God was still there, but they wouldn't listen to him. And so this um, idea of pain seized you like a woman in labor, there's no stopping that once it begins, and they're going to pay the price for their adultery and, and, and leaving God. Yes, and it, it really have to, in my view, you have to kind of go into chapter into verse 10 to get where he's going with this. Uh, the woman in birth pangs will go forth from the city, and you shall dwell in the field, and to Babylon you shall go. Okay, and there you'll be delivered, and so on. So you really have to put it together, it seems to me, to get the point. But I think the idea of what Terry expresses is what he's saying is, what, you don't have a king to protect you? Why are you going to go into captivity? Why are you suffering these problems? You don't have a king? Remember, why did they ask for a king in the first place, back in 1 Samuel 8? Why did they ask for a king, Terry? They wanted to be like the nations around them. To be like the nations around them and to fight their battles for them, to protect them. Well, here you see, why are you having these problems? You, got, you had a king. I let you have one. Now, where is your king? Where is the protection? I, th I think that's the point that he's making. Where is your counsel? You, you, and it's as though they didn't have a king. They did have one who was called a king, but he wasn't doing what they thought he would do, what they hoped he would do. And most, more than that, he's not doing what God wanted him to do. So they're going to go into captivity. So here you are. I, I would have blessed you even now, and I will bless you in the future if you will serve me under the New Testament, but right now you're having problems. Why are you having problems? Because uh, he said you're in pain, you're in labor, like a woman in birth pains, and you're going to go from this city, dwelling in the field, and go to Babylon. So now you're going to suffer because you're not doing what's right. Like I said, the king says in chapter 3, the rulers aren't doing what's right. You're going to go into captivity. But I have this promise for the future. When you come back from Babylon, eventually there will be the blessings that he has to offer them uh, and the gospel. That's what seems to me to be the point here in verses uh, 9 and 10. Other comments or discussion on verses 9 and 10? Notice the last part of verse 10, where he says, To Babylon you shall go, there you shall be delivered, there the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Okay, so they're going to go into captivity, but the Lord's going to redeem them, they're going to come back. That's the promise, you'll go, you'll come back, and eventually... The Lord will send uh, uh, the law from Jerusalem and the, you become the house of God and so on. Okay. Questions, comments, to verse 10. Terry. The idea uh, is also there, I think, isn't it, that they will repent as they're in that captivity when God's going to buy them back? They will learn. Okay, okay so some of them repent, isn't it? Not, Not all of them. When, when we read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they came back from the captivity, and, and we see that, that uh, so the problem of idolatry was pretty much cured by the captivity. Now, now this is the thing that he brought up again and again and again, and they kept worshiping other gods. So they didn't mean to stop that, but they the captivity. The captivity apparently did cure it. You don't read about idolatry after they come back from the captivity. But there was other sins, there were other problems. So in a sense, yes. 
And some of the people, of course, as the Rumi and Maya, some of them did repent. Uh, they knew what they were trying to handle, they knew what they were trying to get But uh, not all the people, it's always the Rumi, always the Rumi, that are faithful. Okay, so God sent them in that captivity, teach them, to bring them back, and eventually he's going to fulfill the promise to Abraham that uh, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through their sins. Uh, we're going to finish the chapter and go to the end of the chapter 5.